There we go. Um, welcome everyone to um, Invest in Open Infrastructure's community discussion today. Um, my name is Emmy Tang. I'm the engagement lead yeah. at Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, and I will sort of start, kick off, introduce this call today. Um, and I also will um, want to note that we, other than the recording, we also would like to have a uh, live automatic transcription through otter.ai for uh, to increase a little bit the accessibility of our call today. So I'm just gonna go and start that as well. Um, there's a little thing that says it's live streaming, it's not live streaming, it's live, live streaming to the transcription service. So just so you know that that's what's happening. Um, a little bit of, uh, logistics before, a little bit more logistics before we start. Um, call is recorded, there's live automatic transcription. You can access that via the button on the top left of your screen, I believe, where it says live stream um, to custom streaming service. Um, if you click the little arrow, there's a link to the transcription that's happening. Oops, sorry. Um, move back, sorry. Um, this is an interactive session. We hope you have loads of questions, especially from the reading that you've all been sent, uh, that we shared with you. So if you have any questions, comments, or resources that you'd like to share with the rest of the participants during the session, um, please feel free to put it in the Zoom chat or use the raise hand button and um, we'll, we'll, when the time is uh, appropriate, we'll ask you to, we can ask you to unmute and share your thoughts. Um, please try to keep your microphones on mute when you're not speaking um, so that we can hear the speaker nice and clear. In terms of um, what this call is designed for today, um, this, is, this is really designed as a place for learning and conversation. Um, we ask everyone to be curious, um, ask for clarifications, ask the questions to challenge all of, all of our thinking, hold space for others, be curious about others' perspectives, and hold space for each other to ask questions and to contribute. And last but not least, uh, we want I would like everyone to be respectful because we want to build community and not tear it down. So uh, for those of you who may be new to IOI, this is the 30 second introduction to, to invest in open infrastructure. Um, we're committed to uh, working to sustain effective infrastructure that is needed for open knowledge to flourish. Um, and we do this through three ways, three main ways, uh, by conducting research uh, to increase our understanding of the current landscape, by creating resources that are uh, sort of actionable recommendations for decision makers to assess, build and invest in open infrastructure. And then last but not least, we do convenings, events like this one to coordinate stakeholders, to stimulate interesting conversations and to uh, pilot solutions to help uh, the investments in and support the resourcing of open infrastructure. Um, this discussion today is organized by our Community Oversight Council. Um, they are a, a non-voting governance body of IOI. Uh, their purposes are to surface the themes, trends and issues in the open research and scholarship infrastructure sector and adjacent spaces provide a collaborative safe forum for discussion, pretty much like this one, um, and to advise and inform the IOI staff and steering committee on, um, you know, to ensure that the work we're, we're doing is serving our community. Um, Sarah, who is one of our speakers today, is a co-chair of our uh, Community Oversight Council. Um, we also have the two other members on the call, Shay and Jenny, and I wonder um, if you'd like to say a quick word about yourself. Uh, Shay, maybe start with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Shay Swagger, he, him. I'm a senior researcher for the Future of Privacy Forum, but I am super excited to be here with all of you today, and I'm a huge fan of their work. And yeah, let's dig in. Jenny. Thank you, Shay. Jenny? Hi, my name is Jenny Rose Halperin. I am the executive director of Library Futures, a think tank for the future of libraries. I use she, her pronouns, and I am really excited to be here after a year on the IOI Community Oversight Council, uh, getting to work with Shay and Sarah, which has been so special. And I am a Sarah Lambden super fan, and I'm so excited <laughs> to uh, hear more about uh, her upcoming book as well. 
Thank you so much, Jenny. All right, so um, we all, we would all love to, uh, as I said, this discussion is organized by our Community Oversight Council, who you just heard from. Um, so through this call, we hope to raise awareness and stimulate discussions in the open scholarship uh, community around some of the ethical and accountability issues that we see in the technology and infrastructure that we use day to day. And we'd also like to explore um, our individual and collective roles in driving change. Um, and as Jenny was saying, I can't wait to hear from um, our expert speakers today, Mackenzie and Sarah, who are experts on um, these data analytic companies, the data brokering and um, surveillance activities, and these activities impacts particularly on marginalized groups. Um, so with that, I would like to actually hand this conversation over to our facilitator, Dinesh McCoy. So just a little introduction to who Dinesh is. Um, Dinesh is a staff attorney at Just Features Law, working at the in intersection of technology, racial, racial justice, and immigrant rights. Um, we're so, so grateful to have you with us today, Mackenzie, Sarah, and Dinesh. Um, and I'm really excited about this next hour, 50 minutes of conversation. Dinesh, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Emmy. And it's uh, it's really wonderful to be with all of you and uh, just be part of this space. I certainly um, spend a lot of time sort of nerding out about this, these issues and but it's really more exciting to, to have a uh, community discussion and really hear, I'm excited to hear what your questions are and uh, even more excited. I, I too am a super fan of both of the speakers here today. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be in conversation with both Sarah and Mackenzie today. Um, first, I'm gonna briefly just uh, give introductions of, of them and then we'll jump right into the questions. Um, and so uh, I want to start with uh, introducing Mackenzie. Uh, Mackenzie is a writer um, and has written for Harper's, National Geographic, Rolling Stone, Outside, uh, the New York Times Magazine, and the London Review of Books. Uh, he's a National Magazine Award finalist. Um, his first book, Windfall, won a Penn Literary Award and was named Book of the Year by The New Yorker, Mother Jones, Salon, and Amazon. Uh, he's also a former Knight Wallace Fellow and Open Society Fellow, uh, and is currently based in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so great to have you, Mackenzie. Uh, and Sarah, I'll briefly introduce you as well. Sarah is a professor at CUNY School of Law. Uh, go CUNY. My partner goes to CUNY for grad school. <laughs> so huge CUNY fan here. Um, she has a master's degree in library science and legal information management and a law certificate in environmental law. Her research focuses on information law and policy, um, and her current projects focus on the transitions of publishers and library services providers toward personal data collection and analytics and the implications of this transition on privacy and intellectual freedom. Um, and as you all know, she has a forthcoming amazing book on these topics, Data Cartels, uh, which hopefully she was able to share uh, an excerpt from before this discussion. So hope you all have had the chance to check that out. But uh, without further ado, I really want to get into the discussion with both Sarah and Mackenzie. And um, I'll start out with a question for both of them. Um, and uh, whoever wants to go first can take it first. But you know, you both have such deep expertise in data analytic analytics companies and data brokers and their role in building uh, surveillance tools. Um, but I'd be really grateful to just hear sort of when you both became first alarmed about the role of these companies and um, how that's kind of from that point how your work has built to your trajectory today, focusing on. Uh, data brokers. Perhaps maybe Sarah, we could start. Okay. With you. <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> okay. So um, I started working on this. It's funny. One of the reasons I immediately thought of Dinesh when I thought of this topic was because I feel like we both came into this at about the same time. Um, uh, in 2017, I was working as a law librarian at CUNY, and um, I 
saw an article about ICE's extreme vetting program. And at the time, there, I mean, ICE has always been a very contentious agency, in my opinion, an agency that um, doesn't need to exist and has had a very short life. And in that, in, in its in its lifespan, has has done a lot of human rights um, questionable, if not just completely anti-human rights activities. So they were building a massive tech, technological like surveillance program, and I noticed that um, Thomson Reuters and Reed Elsevier Lexis Nexus were both on this list of people or of, of, of um, companies that had attended something called an investor day for ICE's extreme vetting program, which means that these companies were interested in getting contracts to work on ICE's surveillance systems, along with, you know, Palantir and all these other companies who were doing all sorts of questionable predictive policing stuff. And as a librarian, I was not very comfortable with that uh, because librarians, I mean, basically my role was to kind of be a de facto trainer and, and teach hundreds of, of lawyers how to use LexisNexis and Westlaw for their research. Uh, Westlaw is a Thomson Reuters product. So I asked the companies uh, to tell me more about these programs and they weren't very forthcoming. And a colleague and I posted a blog post on the American Association of Law Libraries website, um, just raising the topic. We didn't we didn't prescribe any action. We didn't say anything controversial. We just said, hey, we, we noticed this in the news. What do we think about this? And it immediately got pulled off the website. Um, the organization claimed that the, the, um, the post could end with litigation from one of the companies and they were afraid of being sued. And so that made me more curious. And I just, I started digging and I started doing a lot of research and I would kind of do the research to like try to make myself feel better, you know, try to justify my own existence as a law librarian so I could keep on doing my job without feeling bad. But the more I found, the more I realized that that is impossible and that these companies are actually doing really invasive and widespread data analytics work across multiple sectors, not just immigration, not just law enforcement, not just insurance, not just healthcare, but they're, they're building data products um, that assess our risk just in all, and selling them to all sorts of different um, markets and, and big decision makers in all of our lives. So I decided that the only way to um, address the problem was to write a book that explained all of those connections uh, so I wrote the book that that were that you know this talk is arranged around, and hopefully, what I'm hoping is that the book will be a tool for all of you and for everyone who does information work or, you know, surveillance advocacy work, etc. Um, because it explains what these companies do and why it's harmful. And the apologies as I've told a few people I. I'm dealing with COVID right now, so so if I stop and cough for a while, that's that's why. But I'm, um, yeah. So my roundabout way to this was not entirely dissimilar to Sarah's. I was working as a magazine journalist. Journalist. I I'd, I'd written a book before. It was about climate change, and I suppose what was relevant about that was it was a system that seem to do the most damage to marginalized communities and produce winners and losers on a, on a obviously a very macro scale. And and my book agent after that book had come out and said, you know, you should look at this thing called big data. And because it seems like it's got the same qualities as climate change in a way. Everyone says they care, they don't about privacy. It's a big system. It's boring, or it can be, and but there's some real humans on the wrong or right side of it who are probably winning and losing, and so maybe you can find a story in there. And I took that as a mostly environmental journalist until that point, as I sort of, huh. uh, I I mostly reported abroad. Uh, for a lot of my career, especially before I had kids, and I do, I do remember being careful about my communications in places like Russia and China, 
And so my first, insofar as I was afraid of surveillance, it was about protecting sources or honestly my my calls home to my wife. And and so I was one of those people who had VPNs and came up with strange communication ways to have my smartphone communicate back home. I mean, maybe that was the cheapskate in me trying not to pay international calling rates, but I think there was a little more to it. So I had a general awareness of of the of technology and, and a general dislike of the idea of surveillance of me personally. Uh, after the Snowden revelations in 2013, of course, I became more aware that it wasn't just when I was in Russia or China that I should, in theory, be careful about that kind of thing. But it didn't. I didn't come to this specific topic until a magazine called and asked me to look into a potential story about this very strange to me group of uh, mostly uh, very religious, mostly ex-Mormon or mostly Mormon ex-CIA Homeland Security types who were going out into the developing world and doing these child uh, exploitation busts. They were going and setting up these stings and and pretending to be sex tourists. And they would show up and they would arrest everybody uh, or that they would have the cops come in and arrest everybody who came and brought them uh, kids. And and so they, it, the story to me wasn't that appealing and it was a little bit too made for TV. The, the leader of this group of Mormon mercenaries was a little too handsome and, and well-spoken. And so I didn't go anywhere with it, but I did see that they were they were using this product, and it was from a person I'd never heard of, and it was a guy named Hank Asher who just died, and it was this computer product from this genius who they called the father of data fusion. And so I, as I was searching these guys, I looked up this this so-called father of data fusion and this genius, and it turns out to be the guy who built the investigative products at the core of, of LexisNexis is accurate and uh, Thomson Reuters clear that, that Sarah has done such a good job investigating. This one person built this entire infrastructure and he'd become forgotten. And so for me, it was almost the opposite in, in some sense of what Sarah did in that it was, who is this guy? And what did he build? What did he build and how was it used? And eventually I, I did stumble across that same meeting at was it the Hyatt or the Marriott outside of DC where they were they had that list of data brokers who came to do extreme vetting. And I could see suddenly, well, as Sarah said, everybody's using what this guy built. a good segue into the next the, the next question I have, which I think, um, you know, I, I work on in this area, but I think I can hear it over and over again. And I'm not a technologist, so I think <laughs> to the extent that other people can help explain the technology to me and, and others, um, it's always helpful. But, you know, Sarah, I read, I read the excerpt and I think your, um, you know, your discussion about how data brokers are constantly developing and selling more powerful information products was really powerful and disturbing. Um, and uh, you talk about you know, how these companies emerged and practices emerged out of companies that really saw themselves as publishers before. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the expansion of, of those companies and, um, and just how these companies uh, Thomson Reuters, LexisNexis have, have really evolved into something uh, far different than what they were before. Yeah, that is, that's kind of the core of the problem I tried to describe. So I hope, I hope I, I described it in a way that everybody can absorb it, but it really is about the transition of these entities that used to consider themselves publishers into these like mega data analytics powerhouses, right? And the transition was gradual and it goes, it kind of, it, it, its trajectory is the same as the trajectory of like internet technology and, and connected information um, deliveries. You know, the more things could be digitized and put online, the more areas there were to 
monetize information and sell information. And that includes our personal data. Um, so we notice, we see like in the, in kind of the big five, big tech companies, you see how they all consolidate and kind of eat each other up and turn into these mega platforms. And that is also happening with data companies and information companies. They're just for some reason, not as included. They're not, they're not, even though they make billions of dollars and they have, um, they have bigger profit margins than, than any of these other companies. They don't get mentioned along with Amazon and Facebook. I guess they're just not, I, I mean, my thing is they're not used as universally and they're not seen as, um, as daily tools and they're, they're not, so they're not kind of, they're kind of not as creepy, right? We don't all log, you don't log on to Elsevier the same way that you log on to Amazon or Facebook or check your Gmail, but they're just as powerful. And they started out being a bunch of separate companies, right? There was Reuters News, there was Westlaw for Law, there was, um, there was like, there was LexisNexis for, you know, different types of, of data products. There were financial data products. There were science publishers like Elsevier. Um, and so over time, it became possible to put all of these things online in the same kind of binary code format, right? It became very easy to combine these things. And people also invented data analytics. So they invented these systems for, you know, combining data in new ways, algorithms for sifting through data and putting things in order, ways to combine bits of data to create new information products. And these publishers had a wealth of information, right? Like Lexis and Westlaw have more legal information on hand than any other company, maybe in the world, but definitely in the US. Um, Elsevier is the biggest academic publisher in the world. So they have just tons of scientific information and data. Um, Reuters News, Lexis has the biggest news archives in the world, so news. And so they started purchasing and, and acquiring data products like Hank Asher's product, Choice Point, which got, yeah, they actually didn't divide it between the two of them. The Federal Trade Commission intervened because Lexis was about to become a public records monopoly, like a government public records monopoly. And the FTC said, Lexis, you have to divest some of this thing you bought from Hank Asher. You have to give some of it to Thomson Reuters. And that's how they both kind of entered the data analytics, and, um, the personal data analytics business, the data brokering business. So these companies had a wealth of information, they consolidated a wealth of information, and then they started building their own data analytics um, products. They started building, um, they both opened billion dollar technology labs. I think Thompson or LexisNexis wrote at some point that they hire over 7,000 technologists just to build data analytics products to sit through all of their troves of information and data. And that allows them to not only sell the raw data, right? You can buy an Elsevier journal article, you can use Westlaw to search for cases, but you can also buy new data products that they're inventing using those old data troves that they have or pre-existing. Um, so it really became a big new frontier for information vendors. And now these companies don't call themselves publishers anymore. They call themselves business solutions companies or data analytics companies. Um, and and they, they sell our personal data and they imbue all of, all of the other information sets like legal information, academic information. They imbue it with our personal data to make predictive analytics about what academics might be most successful, what academic institutions, um, pharmaceutical companies should pay attention to, uh, what what law cases are going to be the most lucrative, which areas of law law firms should pay more attention to, how particular judges might decide particular cases based on their past, uh, past you know, based on their personal data files in their past uh, decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So they found ways to run our personal data not just through the products that they sell to ICE and law enforcement, but through their own products to make more money. Yeah, I mean, the, the expansiveness of, of these companies and the, the way you frame sort of the monopoly power that they have in, in some cases with the government intervening, but only to a pretty minimal extent um, really is, is overwhelming um, and, uh, I think it's that, you know, what would effective, uh, you know, intervention or regulation really look like when you have 
such massive companies. I see a comment about, you know, how big Reed Elsevier is um, compared to some of these other companies, even though we aren't talking so much on a daily basis about Reed Elsevier. So um, I want to get into uh, some of the specifics of, you know, how these technologies are used in a law enforcement context. So Mackenzie, I'd love to turn to you and you know, I, I know you've done in-depth reporting that shows, you know, how how a clear report or how a Lexis report can really serve as the basis for police surveillance, um, specifically ICE surveillance in some cases. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how ICE uses that, uh, a tool like Thomson Reuters Clear, different from what they would get in, in sort of a Google search of someone's name. Um, and then if you could just talk about what you feel is particularly concerning about the use of these technologies in the policing context, that would be great. Sure, I can I, I can speak especially to ICE. I did a, a a couple years of reporting on on how ICE used data tools, especially from these brokers, to track down a group of of uh, undocumented folks living in Washington State, um, and and so I I tried to reverse engineer the investigation that the ICE officers themselves did to try to understand what are they using, how are they going after people, and ultimately how do these tools affect who they're going after, which I think is it gets to your last question and is maybe uh, pretty important in a, in a case when you have say 12 million undocumented folks in the country and 6,000 ICE uh, enforcement officers and they have to prioritize or at least go after somebody and not somebody else. Um, and so how is CLEAR different than Google? Well, it, it's built for investigators. From the start, it was built for cops or insurance investigators. It was built for someone who wants to know specifically, where does someone live? Where do they live now? What do they drive? Who do they know? How can I find them? And so for, a, for some, an entity like ICE, that's ultimately what you wanna know, is where can I find my targets? Uh, Google can absolutely find all sorts of things about a person's life, but but what they want isn't actionable, maybe to a marketer, but not not so much to a cop. And it does that by by pulling together these bits of information from myriad data sources. And that can be utility records, and it can be your driver's license, it can be your car registration. Uh, it can be when you sign up for a cell phone, get divorced, married, get a traffic ticket, uh, have a, a anything and anything having to do with the court system, and it's a lot of things in particular that you can't opt out of. If you're worried about being surveilled, and of course in this country many people are, you can try to minimize your footprint in some ways. You know you can. Let's say you go buy a, a, a burner phone, a prepaid number, or you or you go and and register your car and even register your car in someone else's name. You aren't posting a lot on social media. You you don't have a, a Facebook account. Even so, you can't get by in this country for the most part and not have uh, say utilities. You can't you can't escape everything. You can't, ultimately, if you wanna be able to drive, you often do wanna get a license. You wanna have a car in your name. Uh, you want to use a bank so that you can, you wanna have a change of address so you can receive mail. And then those postal service change of address forms get sent to the data brokers. The fundamental things a person needs to do to live in this country are the things that data brokers care about most. And so they're getting them not just from public records, but also from the credit agencies, the big three credit report reporting agencies. As someone once said to me, you often tell you often tell your bank before you tell anyone else when you moved because 
you want to get paid. You want you want to be able to use your credit card. So if a person has credit in this country, they're usually going to find their way with a very updated address in these data broker lists. So uh, specific to to what I looked at in Washington State, they they relied on tools that were similar to the ones produced by these data brokers, uh, specifically ones coming from the, the state equivalent of the DMV, with these databases where they could see who owned a car they might have seen drive by, driven by somebody who might look a little bit, say, Mexican to them, whatever that means. And so I think there was some profiling early on at a place where it was thought to have a lot of immigrant workers uh, in the in the oystering industry. And so these ICE officers would sit at first early in the Trump administration outside where the workers went to and from the fishing boats and they would write down license plate numbers and then they would go back and they would figure out who was driving those vehicles. They would try to ascertain if those people were undocumented and then they would tend to know where they lived and what they drove, even what their patterns were after surveillance. And then when people left their house, they would arrest them right outside of it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's extremely disturbing. And I think uh, I definitely encourage folks to check out the link that Sarah dropped in um, that uh, is Mackenzie's article on this. I think we certainly learned a lot at my organization. and We've been trying to follow some of the threads of, of the um, ICE investigation tactics that uh, were exposed in that article. So thank you so much for, for doing that work of, of really uh, digging in and, and questioning what's happening. Um, yeah. So I'm going to break in. I know this is completely unorthodox for the world of moderated discussion. Um, but yeah, and also uh, I think uh, Joe dropped a link to about additional information about the kind of work that um, Dinesh's organization, Just Futures Law, and Mi Gente and Immigrant Defense Project and other organizations have been working on following the leads that McKinsey described so clearly and elegantly and powerfully in his writing. Um, because these surveillance webs and, and surveillance kind of constellations, these companies and, and, and agencies that are working together are very opaque and very hard for the public and for lawyers and you know immigration advocates and immigrants themselves to see. So I feel like a lot of the work that we do um, is trying to make the invisible system visible. And I know Dinesh is dedicated to doing a lot of that work as, as well as the other people that I see on this call who do amazing work um, advocating um, on behalf of uh, are advocating against these types of invisible surveillance systems. So to that end, I can't not ask Dinesh um, about his work as a lawyer. So as a lawyer who works on issues around these products every day, like you are you are helping people navigate these systems, um, what concerns you and what kind of work are you doing to address the potential issues that we've discussed thus far and, and kind of the, the description that um, Mackenzie described um, just now? And also, what do you think we should be doing? What would make the most sense and, and help us the most um, to navigate and shut down these systems? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I think there's a lot. I mean, there's so much that is really concerning. Um, but, uh, you know, my organization and our work really focuses on the immigration uh, impacts of data broker technology. And so while I definitely think that there's a lot outside of that sector, um, I'll focus on sort of the immigrant rights implications. Um, you know, one of the things that we recently did is uh, file a Freedom of, in Freedom, of Freedom of Information Act lawsuit uh, to learn about you know, the scale of ICE's use of data broker technologies. And um, right now their primary contract is with LexisNexis to be, um, you know, to use as an investigative product. And what we learned is that even within a scale of only seven months in uh, 2021, uh, ICE agents had run 
over 1.2 million searches in LexisNexis, primarily through their uh, Accurate Virtual Crime Center product. And as you just kind of heard Mackenzie talk about, uh, Accurate gives uh, ICE agents access to all sorts of data sources and um, you know utilities, driving records, all, all different types of over a thousand different types of data sources. Um, and you know, these aren't things that immigrants or other people can really opt out of as, as Mackenzie spoke to. And I think, you know, the ubiquitousness of, of sort of, um, you know, the level of surveillance that ICE is engaged in. Um, Mackenzie made the point of like, who exactly is ICE, ICE targeting with this kind of surveillance? Well, we know it's, the hundreds of thousands of people potentially. Um, we had, those are huge numbers, 1.2 million in seven months, but that's only a small chunk of time. We we don't have any information since September 2021 of last year about uh, the continuing surveillance. So I think it's, I mean, it's extremely concerning. Um, we still are working to learn more about how these tools are used on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's also, you know, a question of um, of really thinking through, you know, investigations are really leading to deportation and detention decisions, and so um, we're working with, you know, folks in Mijente, um, folks in communities around the country, uh, and really thinking about, you know, how do we how do we really we know the scale of these. Um, surveillance numbers, but how do we connect these investigations and uh, these searches to individual people's stories of how people have ended up in detention, ended up with their families targeted by ICE agents. Um, and, you know, that's a continuing difficulty because a lot of that information is totally mired in secrecy. Um, ICE will withhold a lot of that information when you when you try to seek it out on behalf of clients. So. Um, you know, it's one thing to say that there's there's so much going on, but it's another thing to you know connect it to individual people's stories. And I think that's part of what this kind of data collection does. Is it's like uh, ICE has so many different tools and so many different ways of getting information about people that you know they don't need to necessarily spell it all out in terms of how they're they're finding people. Um, and as Congress continues to just invest more and more in ICE having this kind of infrastructure without real oversight, um, I think it's you know it's going to be harder and harder to connect the dots on just what like which of these technologies and how these investigations are are happening on the ground. Um, and then the second thing I'll say is I think you know my organization is is working on. Um, legal challenges to some of these technologies and some of these companies. Um, and there are certainly like laws on the books um, in different states about uh, people's right to control aspects of their own information. Um, and all of our information, most people on this call, some of our information is ending up in the hands of, of LexisNexis and subsequently all the people LexisNexis and other companies are contracting with. Um, and so it's really a question of, you know, how are there are laws on the books that protect this kind of information that that people have the right to control, but how are courts actually going to uh, rule on these issues when these companies really haven't been tested in many ways? And um, speaking outside of sort of the litigator role, I think, you know, this is really a question. Getting back to Sarah's point about what is regulation in this area look like? We have certainly some laws and um, some bills being proposed now on different aspects of data protection. But you'll see every time one of these laws is even introduced as a potential bill, the data brokers just pour in lobbying money to say, you know, we need to water this down as much as possible. We need to shut this effort down. And I think it's really concerning to kind of see that, I mean, as a nation, we're we're far be behind uh, many other countries in terms of data regulation, and so uh, I think we have a long way to catch up. But also, 
uh, there needs to be political courage to really look at what regulation of these companies would mean and look at the harms not only to immigrants, but uh, to all sorts of communities that I think are, are facing the crush of what this kind of data collection on all of us creates in the world. Um, I could talk about this for a long time, but uh, I wanna give some time for questions from uh, all of you at the end. So I'm gonna end it with a question for both uh, Mackenzie and Sarah as well, and turn it on you also to just talk about uh, where you see potential reasons to be hopeful um, about uh, the abuses of these data analytics companies. And then I think for this, this community that's gathered here, um, what advice or thoughts you have for folks who uh, find ourselves using tech tools that these companies are offering, um, but have serious privacy concerns about the implications of what these larger companies are doing. Like I, I've, I'm certainly guilty of frequently using uh, Westlaw almost every day, um, but knowing that uh, Clear is one of the products that Thomson Reuters offers. So um, open to both of you if you have thoughts on those questions. Well, I'll just speak up because I realized I didn't complete one thought before we get into hope and, and all else was the, the question of who are these tools going after? Who are they being? And I think it's true that they're going after lots of people, but it's important to think about, and I thought about this a lot when I was working on, on my magazine story, was who puts out a bigger data trail? Who puts out a bigger plume of data? A, a mom who's been in this country living undocumented but living here for 10 or 15 years, might have American born kids, might have a real life and an established life and all these things that come with an established life, or American things like cars and credit cards and banks and, and a home in her name, or someone who's come recently across the border or maybe someone who's, who's hiding from, from the law for other reasons. And what I found, even when I talked about people who thought lots of different things about what our immigration system should look like, and if we should let people in, and if I should exist, and if it should be strengthened, all these questions, but point out that to those people who want to put up a giant wall and say, okay, but we have 6,000 ICE officers, look at who's being surfaced by these systems. Does that make sense to you? Is that who you want to focus our attention on? And I would think that the answer is no. It's certainly no to people who, who don't want uh, ICE to exist, but I think it's even no to people who want ICE to be an effective and strong border agency. The idea of surfacing a mom who's lived here forever with her American born kids does not make sense. Um, as for uh, hope, you know, I, there has been some recent success in uh, with utilities, for example, uh, there was some attention paid to how utilities data was making its way through, I won't get into the details, but through a consortium, utilities data was making its way to the biggest data brokers. And that link has now been broken because people started paying attention and making to that and making noise about it. Uh, the same could be seen in places like Cook County, which you guys will be more able to speak to than I am. But I think I read somewhere recently about, I think I read a quote that really resonated with me and it was relevant to this group. It's that, that one generation's solution can be the next generation's problem. And I'd say the solution in, let's say the seventies, when we had this, this rash of open public records laws, was the idea that transparency was an unallayed good and that transparency at a state level or federal level was, was allowing people to know what their government was doing and therefore we would have a better democracy. And the computer age has changed that. How did, how did these data brokers get their information? Well, at the state house level, this is not federal information. This is not exclusively or even primarily coming from 
from you know, Facebook or, or Google or these ones who are hoarding their own data for their own marketing purposes. It's coming from local and state governments. And so the game is not perhaps different for activists than the abortion fight is right now, which is that it's a local strategy. It's a state house strategy. It's cut off every spigot, cut off every data spigot if you want to stop this because not using the tools once they're already built may not be as easy as sort of kneecapping them before they can get going. So as a journalist, I see that I'm not advocating for one thing or the other, but certainly I see that if this all started locally with these streams of data being pulled together until they wash over all of us, then you stop the streams. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And it's something that I actually, I discussed that in my book, like we have this opportunity right now to kind of stop a lot of these things before they go farther, right? And it's much, once once you build, you know, once you build the monster and it's operational, there it, 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 it has its own power um, and, and people will figure out how to use it and buy it. But if you shut off, some of these spigots of data. Um, I think there's an opportunity to maybe build, build, I mean, it's all about building our information structure in a way that we think is just and right um, and that protects everyone's interests. Uh, yeah. And as far as one thing that gives me hope, um, I think that even the fact that we're all meeting here, that gives me a lot of hope. So. When I first started working on this in 2017, Mackenzie had not wrote his, written his New York Times piece yet. Like Dinesh was still in law school. Um, I actually like he's been working on this issue for so long. Um, and we were not organized. We didn't know each other. I didn't know. I didn't know what Just Futures Law was. I, you know, didn't. I. I wasn't familiar with No Tech for Ice. No Tech for Ice had just put out their first report, which I relied on a ton once I found out. You know, once I once I started making these linkages. But their report was the only thing out there, right? They were working alone, and they were pushing this huge boulder of up a hill and, and and their their main goal was to inform the public that this was that there are these data companies that were causing these problems right and i think that you know then i joined them and i started pushing the boulder and then mckinsey you know wrote a piece that really kind of pushed the boulder and we were all working together and and gathering kind of steam around these ideas and um and now like Mackenzie and I both are, you know, drafting and publishing books on the topic. And there's, there's, a, there's so much more literature out there. And, and Just Futures Law is, is filing lawsuits, right? And they're filing lawsuits in partnership with other organizations and other organizations like, you know, um, STOP, Stop um, Surveillance, which is another organization is filing lawsuits. And, and so there, there's kind of this recognition around this problem that didn't even exist, you know, five years ago. So that gives me hope. I think the fact that when now, when we talk about legislation um, that might limit the use of data brokers in law enforcement, that legislation is being taken seriously, where I don't think five years ago it was, or anybody was prioritizing it. So I think we're headed, I mean, the direction that we're headed gives me hope, not because I think that everything's going to be a victory or everything's going to be easy, but because we are all aware of the problem now and we all care. And that goes a long way. Yeah, I mean, I certainly, I certainly echo that sense of hope and possibility that you're talking about. And uh, it's been interesting to go from law students signing a petition at my school to you know, evaluate how we were using LexisNexis and Thomson Reuters um, to now working on these issues more concretely and work, working with you all and, and so many other amazing people on uh, really raising awareness, but also taking some action. Um, and uh, I could say so much more about <laughs> some of those actions, but I want to give space to folks' questions if, if you have them. So um, if you want to chat them in, or I don't know how how best to do this, but. Yeah.
feel free as well to come off mute if you're if you're comfortable. I see a hand uh, from Jenny. Hi. Um, so I think y'all might be able to anticipate this question. Um, but there was part of the question of what can individuals do? You know, um, Dinesh used to be used uh, Westlaw every day. And then I'm wondering, you know, what what are what can institutions do, for example? So, you know, what can law libraries, law librarians, people who are in charge of making purchasing decisions, maybe not for the same products um, that are um, implicated in surveillance, but for other products from the same company, what can you know, shareholder activism do, what can um, sort of the various levers, um, positions, right, the various levers that we have on hand um, do in order to stop um, some of the worst abuses by these companies. Yeah, I think that's a really good question um, and something I should have mentioned in the, the hopefulness part. So, there's a lot of great work uh, kind of starting to develop on an individual and institutional level around these issues. And so to Dinesh's point, when he said like, I, I, I literally work to prevent this kind of surveillance and I use Westlaw every day. Like I deal with that with my law students all the time. They're like, well, what can we do? We have to use Westlaw and Lexis. And that to me highlights the problem of information monopolies, right? We hate their practices. They are doing things that harm our clients and we have no choice but to use them because there's no equal option, right? So one of the first things I tell librarians and library decision makers is that we need to, or you know, it might be a good idea to support competition in the markets. So we actually soon, um, we are, and I know <laughs> just be, uh, um, uh, Library Futures, I think uh, is, is gonna be a part of this, um, but, um, Library Freedom Project and some other organizations, we have made a guide about um, the, the data security and data privacy implications of every legal research product to show which products are, you know, are better at protecting people's data and not engaging in this kind of data brokering, protecting privacy. So if libraries factor in privacy into their decision making and and foster competition by Leanna you know, like maybe teaching how to use fast case teaching how to use case text or or a judge said that they would take case text citations in their briefs you know so kind of breaking breaking that duopoly in the legal information world I think would go a long way to helping give uh, researchers legal researchers more options so they don't feel like they have to use only Westlaw um, so that's the first thing and the, um, the second thing that I've seen a lot of library institutions, and academic institutions start to consider is infusing their contracts with privacy language. So if you have to sign a contract to use Elsevier products or LexisNexis products, how about strike a deal and negotiate a deal with the, with the, the vendor that you will only use their products if they protect your patron's data, right? If they protect users' data or, you know, other privacy uh, clauses that you might be able to insert into uh, contracts with, with these companies if you are buying their products. Um, and then finally, you mentioned shareholder action. Um, and I think that that, is, that that has also played out. So in Canada, a major union uh, called BCGEU that actually um, has a lot of shares of Thomson Reuters, which happens to be a Canadian company. The Thomson family runs it. Um, they filed a shareholder action. Um, and now Thomson Reuters has to write a report about the financial implications and potential risks of doing a surveillance and other work that might violate you know, human rights standards. So shareholders have a lot of power. And one thing I, so the final, group of people of constituents that I think about are students. So students are the next generation of lawyers. They're the next generation of scholars that will use Elsevier products, right? They are major users of these research products and eventually they'll be like the major buyers of you know the licenses with these companies. I think of them as a special group because consumers can also complain, right? Consumers, even if you have to use Westlaw, you can tell Thomson Reuters that you don't like them, that you don't like what they're doing, right? I use LexisNexis 
but I don't use it proudly because of X, Y, and Z. I know LexisNexis, and I'm not sure if Elsevier does this too, they really care about student sentiment towards their products because they understand that these are consumers and they send out surveys all the time asking, you know, how do you like our service? What can we do to improve? You can write whatever you want in those surveys, right? You can complain about their, their companies in those surveys and they do notice. Um, with my work, LexisNexis did not care about my complaints until they noticed that metrics at my law school were were dropping. Students were signing in less. They their survey answers weren't, you know, all fives. They were starting to go down. And that made them, that made the companies take notice. So I think students have a special level of power. And there's there's even a student movement among law students. Um, I think it's called like end your con and the contract or I I usually know exactly what it's called and now I'm blanking on it, but they, um, they are, it, there are student groups all across the country working on that kind of thing as future consumers of these products. I think we have perhaps uh, time for one more question before we wrap up and um, so folks want to, if not, feel free to jump in with a question, but I also just want to give a plug to something Mackenzie was talking about earlier, which is, you know, the importance of localized uh, investigation and action. I think, uh, you know, we have um, seen Mihente and other folks launch an invest investigative efforts in Cook County in Chicago area. Um, and look at how local uh, government institutions are sharing or contracting with LexisNexis and how data from things like local uh, law enforcement or local utilities or different, different entities is ending up in the trail of information to ICE. And um, I definitely encourage folks to ask questions in your local government context to see you know, what are, are does my government, uh, local government have a contract with LexisNexis? If so, what information are we sharing? Um, and those are public records requests that, you know, I'm helping facilitate on a regular basis, but anyone can really be doing that work and, and investigating their local context. Sarah, there's one question in the chat. I don't know if there's time to answer it, but if you want to. Sure, yeah, I'll just, answer real quick. Sorry. Or should I? Uh, uh, yeah, no, no I think or you not. Should. I, sorry, I think you should. Um, I just want to say uh, to folks who have to leave, thanks for joining us. Um, we'll keep recording, and so you could still catch up this last bit. But if you do have to leave, uh, please do. Um, thank you so much. And Sarah, you can go ahead. Sorry. So I think we are, I think there's an event being planned um, for October, where we will share a more in-depth guide about alternatives to Westlaw and Lexus and what the, you know, what the privacy implications are. Um, but before that, I would just say that um, the reason people rely so heavily on Westlaw and Lexus, there are two reasons. One is because the legal profession is steeped in tradition, and we are very slow to move away from things that we are used to. And there are certain judges and just there, it's kind of a point of practice that when you cite the law, um, you either cite to an official source or you cite to West on Lexis. There's no world right now where you would cite to case text or another platform alternative for legal information. Um, and also Lexis, Nexus and Westlaw have a few features that other, um, other companies don't have um, as well developed. So they have something called a citator that flags the case as either good law or bad law. And other companies are trying to develop that and there are kind of competing citator products coming out, but Westlaw and Lexuses are still the most developed. Um, however, if we would give more support to these alternatives, they would have more money um, and more resources to build their own citators. Um, and then the other is Westlaw and Lexus are both also associated with legal publishers. So they have a lot of secondary sources. They have legal encyclopedias. They have all these treatises and law books that, that explain the law. And those are also 
a part of their their services. And so a lot of people rely on certain loose leaf books or encyclopedias to do their work. And they get those also through Westlaw and Lexis. And that's part of being a gigantic legal information empire is that you have all the information and the company with all the information wins, right? So another thing that that the competitors will do if they are supported enough is start to develop their own materials and also maybe even be in a situation where they can license those materials from the publishers themselves and also be able to provide them to users. Um, however, the alternatives, fast case and case text are the ones that always jump into my mind first, just because I think they're very, they're high quality competitive products that are run by people who think very differently than kind of these data analytics empires. But the both of those companies um, are building excellent alternatives that are improving and adding more features all the time. So I think, I, I always, I'm always like, Keep 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 your eyes on fat, fast case and case text because I think that those two companies could really start to um, diversify the the legal information market. That wraps up our our time. Uh, but thank you so so much to everyone for participating in the discussion. And, and thank you so much to both Sarah and Mackenzie for dropping all your wisdom in, in this and, and sharing so much um, and a lot to come still from, from both of you um, that I'm really looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you Thanks so much, Nilesh, Mackenzie and Sarah. Um, I just got a little bit of last wrap up. Um, just want to thank our speakers and everyone who is here once again um, for, for joining us today. We overrun a little bit, but I hope you found that enjoyable. Um, if you're still here, we have a little poll to uh, uh, see how you found the call, um, but also help us design future uh, forums like this for further discussions. Um, so if you could fill that out, that would be really helpful. Uh, while I continue to talk, um, we will, as I said, publish a recap on this call um, on the IOI blog uh, in the next couple of days, hopefully. Um, and also that will come with the recording. In terms of the Community Oversight Council, I just wanna say that uh, we're gonna be, uh, uh, in terms of our strategy, pausing the council activities from next week, so September 15th, as we reflect on this format and our experience in, in this past year um, and how we'd like to move forward. Um, we'll be also sharing another blog post summarizing what the, the amazing achievements that the council has achieved over the last year and the key learnings that we have. Um, here, I just want to take your one minute from you also sort of thank um, Sarah, Shay and Jenny for all your crucial work and contributions in really laying the foundation for um, this governance group. And we really look forward to building on top of this valuable work next year and we'll keep everyone updated. Um, with that, thank you so much once again um, to Mackenzie and Sarah and Dinesh and everyone for joining us. And um, I'm gonna stop this recording right here. <laughs>